see yes or see me oh hey everybody now it looks like we're live let me know if you can see or hear me right now and I'm gonna bring Catherine on in just a minute so it's a little different we're not gonna be side by side which I think is really cool but we do still have the chat oops this way the chat and let me know how you like it or not and my email is over there in the chat as well so all right, well, we're going to begin. It's Design Recharge, I believe it's uh, episode 105. And so Catherine Moore is a friend of mine that I had met at a couple different conferences. I met her at one conference, and then um, I got to know her a little bit better at Creative South, another plug for Creative South. Um, anyway, so she's an incredible illustrator. She has a great wit and personality and she puts that in her illustrations as well. So I'm going to dig into a bunch of stuff with Catherine today. So Catherine, thank you so much. And everybody, hold tight as I change screens. How are you doing, Catherine? Thank you so much right. for coming. Thanks so much for having me, Diane. So I, there might be a slight delay to let people know if I'm moving strangely, but hopefully not. Um, but thanks for having me. I'm glad to be here and talk to you today. All right, so we're going to get um, right into some of these questions, and I want to ask you a little bit about your background, because you kind of have an interesting, you didn't study art in the very beginning, so can you give us a little bit of your background um, and how you started, have you always liked art and design, or is it something that was new? Give us I, a little bit of your I think like everyone who does art, you've just done it ever since you were a little kid, so that's pretty much how long I've done art. So I used to draw children's books and design video games and all of these great things, which I think I saved a lot of, which is kind of cool because I talk to my classes now about kid art a lot, so I at one point went back and photographed all my old high school art and showed it to my class. But yeah, I wasn't an art major in college. I did it all through high school and was really into art and um, when I went to college I just wanted to explore a lot of different things so um, I ended up being a psychology major and after I graduated I really missed creating and I really missed making art and um, I knew that there was this part of me that I hadn't accessed in a long time I had been working on some art throughout college and I would do portrait commissions for people and I would design some posters for bands if they needed them um, but I kind of knew that if I didn't pursue it seriously I might really stop doing something that I really love to do and really be missing out on something that was pretty important to me. So I started researching illustration programs because I really liked the problem-solving aspect of illustration and how you're presented with a problem and you have to come up with a visual creative solution for it. And I think I briefly toyed with graphic design, but I just loved drawing. I'd always drawn. It was something that I didn't want to, I was like, if I'm going to do this, I'm going to make sure that I really love doing it. So I looked at a couple programs. I ended up at Savannah College of Art and Design. Uh, I started in the MA program, stayed for a quarter, thought it was the best thing ever. I was learning so much, and I felt like I was in the right place. I felt like I was four years behind everyone that I was in <laughs> classes with, and I was doing a lot of crash coursing, but... Uh, yeah, but I ended up switching to an MFA because I knew I wanted to teach as well and have that opportunity. So um, I stayed there for the two-year program, and um, now I'm in Atlanta, and I do freelance illustration. I do a little bit of design, and um, I also teach at a couple of universities around Atlanta, Georgia Gwinnett College in Lawrenceville and Reinhardt University, which is north of Atlanta in Waleska. Uh, so that's, that's my backstory. <laughs> So you, we went, we met at CCAC, which is a Southeastern College Art Conference, and it's for art professors, I guess. Uh -huh. And um, we met there, and you are an incredible illustrator. So, and Mike Hendricks is here too. She said she went to SCAP. Oh, cool. She's also an incredible oh illustrator. <laughs> so, um, and then we met up at Creative South, which really wasn't that far of a drive for you being in Atlanta, because it was in Columbus, Georgia. Mm -hmm. uh, what happened at, after Creative South? So at Creative South, you kind of got the spark to search for a, cre a creative community mm -hmm. in your local area. And so how did that go, and what about Creative South inspired you to do that? 
Um, I think I had kind of had a theme from the very beginning of the year, not really a New Year's resolution, but just something to keep in mind, um, a mantra of sorts, of just to connect more, because I was doing um, a lot of art illustration in my house. I wasn't making a lot of new connections. I had, a, had and still have a great community of people that um, I met through SCAD that I still talk to weekly and we exchange feedback with each other and that's fantastic. But I realized I couldn't be stuck in that, that I had to continue growing my connections and my community. So I, um, you know, I just made an effort to get out there and meet people and meeting not just creative people, but people who are active in the community, involved in the community, and very present um, in what they are doing and passionate about what they're doing. And I ended up meeting um, some uh, photographers in Atlanta and they have a workshop that they're doing um, semi-annually now uh, called the Strategy Sessions. And it's for any um, creative person, so I'll uh, put a plug in for my friend Anne's <laughs> workshop here. I think she's doing the next one in January, so you can search for Strategy Sessions on Facebook or online. And um, it was a great mixture of um, photographers, designers, and we talked about a lot of business-related issues, um, a lot of issues just um, about creative motivation and what inspire, inspires us, what we do, what, why we do what we do. Um, and I really appreciated connecting with that group of people um, and learning from them as well. So um, I've ended up just getting community more and finding more people that I want to be working with, um, working on my design skills. I've gotten illustration jobs out of this community, so it's just really fantastic. Um, thing and um, Atlanta is a great place for this because it suddenly became very small world <laughs> in a big city and I run to a lot of people I know now and um, it's always good to when you're going out to that community assert your identity and say I'm an illustrator, I'm a designer, this is what I do and people really respond to that and will say oh that's great I know so and so and um, if you just really put out what you do and what your goals are um, it's people will help you make those connections as well. I keep forgetting I have to click on my face. Sorry. Oh. <laughs> um, it'll get better, I'm sure. And you can tell when I when my face is smaller, you couldn't see when I touch my neck, I get all red. So I have like three spots today. Sorry about that. So um, I know that I think one of the great parts about uh, an illustrator or a designer is their flexibility. For me, that's something that I value. Mm -hmm. um, I know you like challenges and you really embrace them. You have a great attitude. You really go forth and you don't really let anything, I've never seen anything get you down and you just kind of head take it head on. So what about that has made you a better illustrator? And can you tell us about like when you mm -hmm. were asked to finish the project that was started by another illustrator and you had to do it in his style? Can you kind of talk a little bit about that, how that was a challenge and how that made you better? Yeah, I've um, I've always appreciated the craftsmanship challenge of making art. And um, if you look at my work, I work in this pretty highly realistic style, which has been. Um, my challenge is always to try to be more creative with it. And so that's what I'm trying to do more, and I'm hopefully succeeding in that. But I've always just really appreciated the challenge of the craft, too. How do I get this image to look right? How do I get these proportions right? How, am I, how do I um, uh, create this design to flow and have a hierarchy? So I really appreciate the, the craftsmanship challenge of that. Um, I appreciate design projects a lot, because that is also something very challenging to me and it makes it new because I think you get to a point with your skill where you either need to be working in a new media or you need to be tackling a new problem or you need to be using your skills in a different way and um, I think with my portraiture at one point I got to the point where I was like okay I can do those so it's like there's nothing new about it so um, I've started to do these um, surrealistic mashups with the portraiture to make it more creative kind of integrate it with some of my uh, wordplay work, which is in a separate section of my website, separate portfolio. Um, and yeah, recently I got, but also building those, just those craftsmanship skills has helped me out too, because I had a job recently from a local friend, um, and it was just, uh, she had, there were these little spot illustrations, and they were great little illustrations that were um, almost lost line, and almost just like this ghostly image of these objects. 
And uh, there was just a lot of them, so they needed to outsource these. And I was like, oh, yeah, it's something I can definitely do. And the challenge was not to uh, make my style more complicated. It was to simplify my style. And that is a great challenge for me is to take it and simplify it. So um, I learned a lot from, yeah, doing that and uh, appreciated that challenge as well. So let's see some of your work. So um, I don't know what this project is for, and I am having yeah. to use two computers, people, so bear with me. So I'm going to switch computers, and I think this is all one project. Can you talk to us about sure. it? And let us know, people, if you can't hear her while this is on screen. Okay. Can everyone hear me? Good. All right. I'm still seeing your face, but I'm seeing this the little uh, the bear in the car image. Is that the one? Yep. That's okay. The one. Yeah. So this was for a um, design firm up in Brooklyn. They're called Apartment One, and uh, really nice people. I was up in New York a few months ago. Actually, got to meet them, um, and they were working with a client, Paris Baguette. They're a um, uh, bakery chain, and there was actually one location in Atlanta, which I haven't visited yet, but. Um, this was for some packaging illustrations, so they um, actually threw these uh, mashups at me, and um, it was difficult because the reference they gave me was really low quality, so I had to go out and seek out little bits of reference, just the texture of the bear and the bread, and remash it all up together. So a lot of this was their concept on it, um, but it was kind of the perfect job because it was something that was very much in my style and something in my... Um, sense of humor and <laughs> something that I really appreciated working with these images and I got to make some choices in them um, as far as uh, what it was. The concepts were generally from, from them but there's a series of four images so they're on their own packaging illustration now but it was just really fun when you get a project and you're working on it and you're saying oh this is exactly what I wanted to do. It's, it's, it's always fun to work on images that kind of make you laugh when you're, well, like, when you're in the middle of working on them. So. <laughs> Definitely. So yeah. these, these look like um, you're using like a graphite pencil or... Yeah, yeah, it's just graphite pencil. So uh, most of the work on the portrait section of my website, if you go on there, that's all graphite. And um, that was um, a skill I was developing definitely in grad school. I mean, I'd always done pencil drawings, but when I learned how to paint, it actually made my graphite skill way better and um, just started exploring variety of pencils. Um, yeah, so all of that, <laughs> and all graphite. And uh, so there was, I think, one more uh, in the thing, so I'm going to pull oh, it there up. Oh, you go. Okay, right? yeah. Uh -huh. And that one I actually had to do a little bit of a digital overlay on because um, because of the white lines on the um, shaded background, so I ended up doing those separately, laying them over afterwards. I hope I gave you the okay. final version of that. <laughs> it's terrific. I just yeah. blew it up so that people could see. I okay. mean, there's so much detail. So how big are these? Those aren't super big. I actually had to redraw that one. That was the first one I did and I couldn't get the level of detail I needed. So it's probably, um, it's not huge though. It might be 14, 18 inches tall. Um, usually those portraits I do on my website, those are big. Those are 22 by 30 pieces of paper. So um, what also, I used to draw really small. I used to draw on like an eight and a half by 11 piece of paper and I would do portraits that size and I would use my tiny 2H pencil and try to get that level of detail and so I realized oh I don't need to make it this hard for myself if you make it bigger you're going to get the detail when you shrink it down so um, and now I love working big I have I work on an easel when I draw and uh, that was kind of a game changer too just for like the physical effects of drawing on your body if you're leaning over all the time on a flat desk you you know your neck hurts your shoulders hurt and um, it's Drawing is just something that I physically enjoy doing. I'm looking over here, by the way, because my easel's over there, so I'm looking at it <laughs> as I talk about it. That woo! I keep. Uh, I have. I have two mice down here, yeah. so I'm trying to <laughs> use both mice too. It's a little off putting. I'll be better next week. Um, all right. So you're teaching. You teach both. Mm -hmm. Ooh, my thing's falling out. Uh, lecture courses and studio courses. What do you think teaching does for you that you wouldn't get if you weren't teaching? And do you find that studio courses are more fun to teach, mm -hmm. or do you get more out of lecture courses? Well, right now I'm teaching lecture courses. I'm teaching um, uh, 
a few sections of art appreciation, mm -hmm. um, which is a class that I've taught for uh, a couple of years now at Georgia Gwinnett, and then I brought that curriculum over to Reinhardt. And then at Reinhardt, I teach an art history course, which is completely new territory for me. I love the art appreciation class. It is creative, it's exciting, and what I really appreciate about um, teaching is the um, freedom of curriculum I have. Um, so I can really push the course in any direction that I want. Um, I also teach some studio classes. Um, I do workshops every once in a while around Atlanta um, at the Decatur Rec Center, and there's an art school in Sandy Springs that I teach studio courses at. And so I, I get a little bit of that out of my system, and those are very natural to teach because I'm just talking about what I do. So if I'm helping out students there, I just talk about what I my processes for drawing and painting and give them constant feedback and tips on that. Uh, but what I really like about the lecture courses is it's a creative endeavor of itself. I'm designing this curriculum. I'm um, coming up with creative challenges for my students, and especially my art appreciation course, it's all these creativity challenges. So, um, you know, using one object to have an alternative function as another object, looking for um, visual similarities. So we do like a Google Doodles project where they have to look for visual similarities between objects and letter forms. Uh, and it's always knew what my students come up with, and we also can have some really um, involved conversations about art design, um, and it's really exciting too when I have students who are interested in pursuing art and I'm able to um, put them on those roads to, uh, to pursue their interest in that as well. Um, but it's great, I like the balance between that and illustration. Um, I think I need the balance between the human interaction <laughs> and the working on my own. And it's also when you work, you get excited. You're learning something, and when you learn something, you want to share it with other people. So it gives me the opportunity to do that as well. So do you think that teaching your design and your illustration um, is impacted by stuff you see in the classroom or if um, you are another professor, or do you think... Any of that? Oh, I don't know. Uh, Micah, I don't know if your question showed up. I'll have, I'm trying to learn this new nope. stuff. Oh, just so you got type it in this chat, in the, or wherever it is. I don't know which way. Uh -huh. One of the chats. Type it in there, Micah, and I'll get it up. Um, but do you think, because sometimes, I think when you're doing all these creativity exercises, that has to impact your work. But sometimes I'll see a student try something, and I'm like, wow, I never thought to use that tool that way. Um, oh, yeah. I know when you're teaching lecture courses, maybe it's not, it doesn't impact you as much. But when you're teaching studio courses, do you find uh -huh. that that's something that you would miss if you didn't have it in your life? Uh, yeah, definitely. Um, definitely. Um, I, yeah. Um, yeah, I appreciate teaching. I think that the teaching and the art, um, I'm not sure how much crossover ends up happening, but they both kind of come from the same place. They came, come from this need to be creative and to participate in a creative community. And one way through that is doing illustration, and our way to do that is um, through teaching. Um, I actually have a panel at CCAC this year, and it's uh, all about how do you bring your studio practice into your classroom? So I have three speakers who are going to be discussing that topic specifically. So, and I think the reason I made that topic was because I had those questions for myself of what is this interaction that's happening. So I always tell my students when they're working on these um, creative challenges, I say, okay, free ideas, free ideas, and they all raise their hands and they want get some input on that. And I'm like, okay, I'll give you free ideas, but then you have to let me steal yours too. So. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So um, how do you think, because I think that when you um, had imagined the creative community you were getting in to, uh, that you were joining in Atlanta, you didn't, wouldn't have put these people together, but they've been so, it's been nice to have people that were doing something so different than what you were doing. How, mm -hmm. how do you think that that has helped you learn better or attack a problem in a new way? Um, how do you think that's helped? And what things do you think you've learned from that creative community? Uh, I think it's, yeah, it's, um, there was an article in um, Good Magazine the other day a friend of mine posted and it was about how creative people need to have a number of different creative outlets. 
And I think that's just needing to have a number of different outlets. Like if you just draw and that is the only thing you do, um, you're really closing off a lot of different sources of creativity. Uh, I think it was interesting meeting, for instance, the photographers that I've met in the community just because I hadn't looked at photography as an art form for a long time. And it was something that I wasn't great at stuff that I just liked doing it. It was just never something I pursued. And um, being able to get another creative person's input on my design and illustrations who's in a completely different field, they're still visual people and still creative people, So, um, but they're looking for different things. So it gives you a, just a broader range of feedback, and I think that that's been really helpful, really productive. And that, yeah. ah, I keep having to switch things. Sorry, <laughs> Catherine. Ah. It's all good. I'm seeing the same thing, right? <laughs> so, All right, so let's let's talk a little bit about. Um, I'm trying to read the chat too, um, and I still don't know what it is, Micah. So if you would put it back in the chat, um, I will ask it. It doesn't seem to be popping up in a place I can see, and I'll have it figured out by next week. Oh, I see it. Is it where her work? Where's her work generated from? Cold calls, portfolios, agencies. Is that the question? Where do you see that? Oh, I scrolled down. <laughs> anyway, take a screenshot for me and then send yeah, it to right. me, and then I'll be able to um, I'll be able to see it. So, go ahead and answer that question. Yeah, you can answer. Uh, everything, everything. It is, um, which I've I've heard people say, and it's true. So, um, I've gotten jobs from sending out um, random postcards. I've gotten jobs from meeting people. I've gotten jobs through just the web of people you know. And I think that, again, putting yourself out there and just meeting people. Um, yeah, I had, <laughs> I did have a New Year's resolution, um, which was to connect more, but I needed to make that tangible because when you make a resolution, you're supposed to you know, make tangible goals that you can meet. And it was to meet one new person every day by name. And students don't count because otherwise it would be very easy because <laughs> I have like 150 students a semester. <laughs> so there's the year. But... Um, so I, so I did that, and I started just, like, writing down names at the end of the day. And, uh, and one of my friends was like, that's kind of creepy. And I'm like, no, it's great, because, <laughs> because the next time I see that person, I've thought about them, and I've made that connection. And it's been really, and it's been really great. And some of those people become friends. Some of those people you end up working with. Some of those people know someone who knows someone who, um, who needs an illustrator or designer. And so... Um, I, I think it's something that I'd heard a lot but hadn't actually done was just to really, you know, and I'm pretty, I can be pretty introverted, so it was difficult to go out and be like, kind of force yourself into social situations, but just do things that you like to do, and they don't even have to be related to art and design. I got into a cycling community that I love, and then I've done some art and design through people I know through that. So, um, yeah, and also just looking for... Um, well, for, as an illustrator, I'm often working with design companies who are then outsourcing the illustration. So I've um, just been looking at different websites, trying to find work that's similar to mine. And I've had friends refer me to say, oh, you should look at this design from they have work that's similar to yours. And I send them a postcard, and I ended up getting a job through that. Um, what hasn't really worked is sending out a giant blast of postcards. And that's like... <laughs> I, I, however, I know people who have gotten jobs from that, so I can't say it doesn't work. It's never worked for me, and it's something that is kind of my least favorite thing to do because I think it's just so much about personal connection and sincerely seeing a site and saying, oh, your work really looks like mine. I think I could help you out, and sending them a postcard, writing them down, writing down something about them, and then it's going to be more fun for you, too, because you're actually caring about working with these people. And like any job, it's the people you work with are one of the most important things about it. So you want to be working for um, people that you do have a personal connection with um, or just like a good working relationship with. And, um, and so I've been lucky to have some jobs recently where that's that's been the case. I always think that it would be a good idea if you really target some design firms that maybe aren't currently a smaller firm, not like 30 mm -hmm. people or anything, but if you had um, target those firms that aren't maybe doing 
illustration and that if you um, if they have you on their team then and you can show them your you know the breadth of your work and the flexibility then you can start mm -hmm. having them solve more problems and then you can if you come to it as like hey having me as a contractor or a freelancer it's an asset because now I can solve these problems they may not come up right in the beginning but I also agree with you about mm -hmm. that personal connection if, I don't think just a slew of postcards ha uh, helps all that much because they don't connect with you and I think that I know Micah has really used Instagram mm -hmm. and I'm so thankful that she listened that I said just do it just try it because yeah. I think people really connect yeah and and maybe so, maybe a little bit more so than um, Facebook or Twitter and it's such more of a visual so if you could find people that were on um, mm -hmm. people that worked for design companies that were there that they maybe didn't currently do your style then you make a connection with them and continue to talk to them have conversations either on Instagram or off Instagram then it then it allows them to see you as an asset instead of um, oh we don't do that kind of work and maybe they're just mm -hmm. not ever going to do that kind of work I don't know but I always think that that might be because mm -hmm. it's still it's still making that connection but you're using social media to kind of help with that mm -hmm. yeah that was something I got out of Creative South I didn't have Instagram yet and, so, <laughs> and I got there and I had this moment where I was just like my career is suffering because I don't have Instagram I went home and got it and now it's all good but <laughs> but seriously I think you have to put yourself out there in a way that's going to be fun for you because for instance doing direct mail was never fun for me it would just be really pedantic and it would just be like okay I've done my work and now it's off there and I've done what I'm supposed to do but uh, Instagram's fun like you get to you this about connecting with other people and connecting with other people is fun and um, like seeing other people's work is fun and getting comments on your work is fun and it was especially exciting just because it got this range of I don't even know how people find this stuff, but it's whatever hashtag they're looking at. Um, people I've never, you know, never met before who are making comments about my work, and that's exciting, and it's motivating to want to post more. So um, I think however you try to advertise um, your work um, or make connections, um, make it something fun for you, something that's inherently valuable in and of itself, and um, good things are going to come from that. And I think tagging stuff is important now. I think that is a great search mm -hmm. method. And I think if you are searching and there's, you know, 10,000 or 100,000 or 200,000 posts on something, that might be a good one, but it also might be a bad one because it is such a big thing. So it's really kind of good to have yeah. a little bit more like if you're you uh, if you were doing biking or or some of your work mm -hmm. is um uh, about arrested development so you could tag mm -hmm. arrested development or you could tag portraits or you could I think mm -hmm. you gotta be smart and it's it's constantly changing so you have to really be flexible okay. there's not like I'm gonna do this this day and then I get all these people but oh, yeah. mm -hmm. but I but I think that that's something you know if you just tag it as uh -huh. illustration there's so many that are tagged that way uh -huh. kinda hard um, uh -huh. but, you know Micah also said she didn't find any other social media connections uh, as rewarding or as connecting except as Instagram. Can you see that, Catherine? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I can see that. Okay. Good. Yeah. Um, it's been good. I mean, I think Facebook's been pretty good for me, except it ends up being a lot of people I know. I will have random people come onto my Facebook page where I was posting a lot, and um, I'm also through this com creative community, I've met some social media um, uh, social media people and uh, I have a friend who's really big on Pinterest that's her she's like for visual people Pinterest because Instagram doesn't play nice with others so for instance on my Android Instagram will not post to my business Facebook page will post to my personal Facebook page but on my business Facebook page so if I want to post an image I have to post it completely separately on the phone and then like go to the computer and post it on Facebook and that's annoying so yeah, <laughs> yeah, but it is generally. I guess you just have to. I guess do a little bit of of everything, and again, choose the ones that are fun for you. <laughs> so, so let's talk mm -hmm. about the Arrested Development ones. I'm just going to yeah. go straight to it because we don't need to hear, see me. So I, I'm going to just start here and we'll go backwards. Uh -huh. um, 
And these, how big are these? And then, is was this a personal project or was this something Yeah, this new? was a personal project. Um, it was just a portfolio building project because I was, again, trying to integrate this kind of sense of humor illustration. And I have these uh, greeting card illustrations on the whimsy, whimsy section of my website. So I was trying to integrate that sense of humor into my portraiture, which had been some facial expression sort of things, but I had met up with um, Charles Hively, who's an illustration, um, he creates an illustration publication called 3x3 Magazine and Creative Quarterly. Um, actually, designers probably know Creative Quarterly. Um, but uh, I had met up with him in New York, and he was like, your portraits are great, you need to draw famous people. And I was like, oh yeah, that's, that's, a good, that's good advice. So <laughs> I uh, came up with these series of portraits, and I don't I don't know if when I started out I intended to do like all the characters, but I did the first three. It was Buster and George Sr. and Lucille, if you're familiar with the show, and then got such a great response on those that I ended up finishing up the whole series. And then the this was right before the Netflix like season four was about to be um, released, so I was lucky because I just had really good timing of releasing these, and they were really popular just because everyone was so excited about the show coming out that anything about the show ended up being really interesting. So um, so these got into Creative Quarterly, I think issue 33. And, That's great. Um, yeah, which was fantastic. And, um, and then the uh, official Arrested Development Facebook page posted one of them, and that was, that was fun because it got a lot of exposure. Um, so it was definitely great, just great to have this in my portfolio, and um, then I ended up getting jobs from this, including the um, uh, the permanent one job. It was because they saw these portraits and saw it. They didn't, and I appreciate that they didn't just see them as portraits, but they saw them as this rendering skill. And so then I was able to translate that into those little animal car bike images. So I appreciate that they didn't just see it as portraiture skill, but as this is what I can do with graphite in any sort of subject matter. Um, so, it was a, so it was a good thing. Um, oh, I, what I wanted to say about this piece, uh, Catherine, mm -hmm. uh, there's so much, like her skin looks so real and the freckles and the highlights, you're so good at that. And this piece... That's the fun part. <laughs> so how long did this whole piece take you? Oh, yeah, that's a question I get a lot, and um, I got it so much that I had to start coming up with an answer for it, because <laughs> I would work on it piecemeal, but when I worked on these, I found out how fast I could get, because it became such a regular thing. I'd basically have to do, like, two-ish a week to make the goal that I was trying to get them done before the series came out, and it was right after the semester ended, so I had a lot of time, and um, May is, like, the month of the year that I have to make a ton of art, and... Uh, uh, the George Senior one I did in a day. Like I started it one night and I finished it by like mid afternoon the next day. So I think it must have taken me like eight ish hours, maybe a little less. Um, but you, it's you know like anything else, you just practice it and you get more efficient at it. So I figured out how efficient I could get with doing the graphite rendering, and um, and that was kind of good because then when I started working on things like the um, the Jailbird series, the Orchids of New Black, I was like. So I could take my time with these, but I know how fast I could do them if I sat down and really focused. So it was good for me because it helped teach me, teach me some discipline and some focus. Um, the issue with these is I found out I just really hated drawing feathers. <laughs> you did great because they can be really hard for sure, but there's so much detail. And I think one thing that you're terrific about is getting these kind of funky, weird facial expressions and putting, yeah. putting things together in a funny way. That's why I think your wit is one of your strengths. So, and and just these little pieces that you put to the side. I don't know if you can see my mouse. The, um, you know, the Latin. Oh, the scientific names. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> right, right. I thought that was really nice. Yeah. Um, so let me see if I can scroll through these a little bit. Oh, let me scoot out uh -huh. a little bit. It is easier maybe to see when it's bigger, but oh well. Um, but these, I think, are are really nice. And if you've watched the show, you know she's pregnant, so the egg is so fitting. But if you didn't like feathers, I can't imagine that this whole piece would not well, have I been. Well, I found so that after I did the first, the first one I did was a piper because that was the best 
joke there because her name's Piper, so and she's a jailbird, so give her a Piper body, and that's how it went. And that one was actually like the bird itself was pretty small as compared to her head, and so that one I, I got through and was like, oh, this was fun. Yeah, I'm going to do a few more, and it, I mean, that show is full of characters. I wasn't going to do all of them, so I was like, I'll do five. I'll do five, and then I'll, and then I'll stop and move on to something else, and that was the second one I did, the one of uh, Red. I think it was when I got to, like, yeah, the one of Sophia where suddenly I was like, oh my gosh, I'm so sick of shot. <laughs> Those faces are fun, and, like, getting that right micro-expression in the face is the really exciting part about doing portraits. Like, you get to the point where you can lay out your features and you get the proportions right, but to have the face communicate the same expression that an actual face would, that's the really difficult part. And sometimes it's just, like, a tiny angle of the eyebrow or, um, like, a little line on the side of the mouth, and that'll make the facial expression. So um, that ends up being a much more intuitive process because I'm just really having to play with it and figure it out how to get that right expression. But, you know, those feathers could be any feathers. <laughs> so it's because I don't have that kind of end goal with them. Or I'm like, generally, okay, I want this to be a dark area and this to be a light area. And then you go. <laughs> you charm. So, yeah. Um, but there's so much detail. And is that is that something that you consistently have always, you said you like to draw small, was yeah. the detail something yeah, you like? Yeah, I think that I just like getting into a project. I think it's once I get into a project and I get really involved with it, that ends up being kind of the fun part after all the work. The work being the like laying out the proportions, um, really having to step back, think about the silhouette, think about the values um, that are going on, um, making sure you have a good value pattern, like the one with red, like it wouldn't have worked as well if she'd have had like light colored hair. Like that, it's just some. I, there's a portrait of a friend of mine. It's on my website. I don't think I um, gave it to you as an image, but she is this dark hair and she's got this kind of funny expression on her face and these like dark eyes. And then it's just the contrast that keeps like the the dark light, dark light, dark light. That's what makes it interesting. And um, so uh, I mean, it's like you know a good image when you see it as a tiny thumbnail and it looks good and that's just the importance of getting the value pattern in there so it's all you have to think about all those things and you have to remind yourself to think about all those things and then when you get into just the little hair texture and getting the freckles on the skin that's like the reward at the end because um, it's it's pretty relaxing it's just the oh I'm just rendering it <laughs> rendering's easy art is hard <laughs> well I, I yeah. think another just thing time. I think another thing that's great, and this is something if you're not connected to Micah, I don't know which way I should mm -hmm. point. Um, you should, definitely. Uh -huh. He also does great portraits. Okay. And she does something different on the bodies as well, so I think you'll like her work, and she's all talking about it. So, um, so uh, the, to me, your, your humor is, is incredible. Your detail is phenomenal, but something that you and Micah both share is that... Um, you both draw a lot and it's that practice and so yeah, how much much. how much time during the week do you make for drawing? That's a good question that I probably really disappointing answer to because I can't <laughs> I can't come up with a routine it's just um, I think I've tried before tried to do things like draw something every day just draw something every day um, I tend to work in bursts, and um, that's if I have a good spot of, like, safe time where I'm not having to worry about um, teaching or life stuff or other things I'm doing, um, then I will say, okay, this is my drawing time. I block it out, and then I get whatever it is done that I want to get done. But uh, life throws stuff at you, and you've got to be flexible. So um, the best I can do is when I'm... Teaching, I try to set up my schedule in a way that I've really blocked off drawing time. So, um, and I have it pretty much now. It's like Monday, Wednesday, Friday during the day. Like I have free. I'm not teaching. I'm trying to keep my school stuff at school and my drawing stuff at home. My studios in my house, and um, and then just really use that for drawing time. So, but I I don't really try to force ideas either. I actually have a quote on my wall. It's up here by. Henry Miller, where it says, even if you can't create, you can work. <laughs> and I, and it's a good quote, but it's not necessarily just sitting down and drawing. It's just 
getting out into the world and maintaining your inspiration because I feel like if I wear myself out too much with drawing something that I'm not excited about, it takes that energy away from something I am excited about. Like it has to be an idea that I'm excited about or a job that I'm excited about. <laughs> like it has to be, um, I have to have that, that inspiration to um, really find that involved, focused drawing space. Well, um, something else I think we talked about the other day when we were on the phone. We talked about that's one of the beauties of teaching is that you're able to focus time on projects that you really want to do. So when people say, oh, well, you know, I don't know if I want to teach, you know, full time at a college uh -huh. for being a full time professor, but maybe I'll do adjunct. And that, uh -huh. that can really free you up to do because uh -huh. it gives you some money. St mm -hmm. stable money, but then mm -hmm. you're also able, and you said that was kind of something that you really liked, that now you can be a little bit more mm -hmm. picky. You want to talk about that just a little bit? Yeah, yeah. I think I wrote that um, down, actually, when you sent your questions, because <laughs> when I, I um, you know, I've known people who've gotten out of school and are trying to figure out how to make, you know, life work and make artwork and be hopefully getting some, you know, paying design illustration jobs. And it's really difficult to do. And um, I, you know, specifically, I I wanted to teach, and I also was like, teaching would be a really good balance. And I didn't realize how hard it would be to get the teaching jobs. It took a while to get the teaching jobs, and I'm still adjuncting. I teach five classes at two different colleges, so I teach a lot. And um, there's, I mean, I could have a full-time teaching job and probably be teaching less than I am now. It does allow me a lot of flexibility. I don't get to completely choose my schedule, but I get a lot of flexibility in when I choose to teach. I have complete flexibility over what I teach. Um, I'm lucky because I teach um, four of my classes are the same course that I'm teaching to four different classrooms, so that curriculum's the same. I continue developing it and improving it, but I have that core that I'm not spending time on writing new classes. I'm, I can be focusing that on... Um, on illustration. And again, that relationship between the two, the more I illustrate, the better teacher I am, the better, better teacher I am, the more excited I am about going back and creating my own my own work too. Oh yeah. Mm -hmm. All right, so going back to some of uh, you had said earlier, you know, there are certain things that you can do. You can try new mediums, you could try different sizes, you could try all kinds of things to improve skills or whatever. Well, mm -hmm. what kind of things have you done to improve your knowledge of running a business? Because really, yeah. that's what you're doing. Um, yeah. And I think like everyone, I mean, you make a lot of mistakes starting off, <laughs> and it's just, I mean, and it, you do learn more from things that don't work out versus things that do. <laughs> and I can't tell you any, like, jobs that have not worked out that I've learned so much from. And uh, it's the, the the contract thing is just so important. And any advice to anyone who's coming out of school, it's just you have to have a contract. And you're like, oh, but it's my best friend. And it's like, well, then you, ha you absolutely have a have to have a contract or you will never speak to that person again. Um, you need to make any – and they can be clear. They don't have to be in legalese. Um, it's just stating – uh, what your agreement is for that. And then beyond that, um, having a kill fee in your contract. And that has saved me so many times where I've had a lot of jobs that have ended up getting killed because oftentimes I'm working with a design firm and then they're working with a client. So when the client has a complete shift, the design firm then is then communicating that back to me. And if they have a complete shift in what they want to do, then boom, I'm out. And I... and but I still am collecting, you know, usually 50%, 75% on what I've done. Um, and so much of that is into the early stages, the sketches, the um, concepting. And um, again, it's, it's kind of like the rendering where I was saying, oh, that's the fun, easy part at the end, you know. And that's really just 25% of my, my fee in the end. So, um, yeah, absolutely. Having contract, having those kill fees, and just... Um, yeah, really communicating with your with your client. Um, I have worked under other people's contracts before, and I've been lucky because it's worked. Um, I had I worked under a contract, and we didn't have a kill fee, and they still paid me one. But that was that was nice because there was not technically one in there, and I knew when I signed this contract that I was taking a little risk with that. Um, 
So, um, yeah, that's 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 another the biggest thing of just um, knowing what your agreement is and, and keeping things organized just for taxes. <laughs> like, just keep everything organized. Um, I had a um, the uh, workshop I went to in Atlanta actually had a, someone gave a great idea, which was to start. Um, keeping track of your bids whenever someone inquires about a job, even if it doesn't move forward for beyond that inquiry, um, write down what the inquiry was, how much you quoted them, and then what their response to that was. And I think that helps really um, come up with uh, how much you should be charging for different types of jobs and with which type of, like, who you're working with, you know. I think some people are very set, like, if they're doing work for a friend, they take 10% off of their normal rate, and I'm way more flexible with that if I know the person, um, but but just it, it really helps you figure out how much is your time worth, how much are you charging people for your time, and um, and who's approaching you, and what kind of people are approaching you for, for work, too. So I have a question with illustration. Mm -hmm. When I, you know, a client comes back and then they're like, oh, well, we want to add this all this extra stuff, and so it wasn't in the contract, and so mm -hmm. I have a a line item that says if there's anything in addition it'll be billed at blank yes and yeah so how cuz and I also tell how many revisions they're gonna get yes because yeah <laughs> hundreds and hundreds of revisions and not have to charge for that because it's my time yeah but you're really talking about having project um, fees instead of hourly fees. So do you think mm -hmm. as an illustrator it's better to work in a project fee versus hourly? Mm -hmm. Sorry, did you have a second part of the question? Or? Yeah. 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 So then also uh -huh. tell, tell me about um, what do you do with revisions? Yes. Um, I'll answer the second question uh, first, which is the I that was one of my contract fails where I had um, we had sketch phases and I always knew to put in sketch phases because that's kind of how my kill fee would be based on. And if we get through sketch phase one, sketch phase two, is final. You know, it's like fifty percent, seventy five, one hundred percent. What the so I always had sketch fees, and I just I don't know I had not thought about revision fees, and it got to a point with a client where they were asking for all these revisions, and I was like project's kind of done, and what is this? This is new. This is like, it would have been like I'd have to completely redo it. And it was just my realizing, oh, yeah, this is something I should have had in the contract. And I think I did like a reasonable number of revisions for them with it not being in the contract. And then after that, every contract has <laughs> sketch phases and revision phases. So... Um, yeah, that was that's also important to keep in there. Um, I know I I will bill roughly hourly. Um, I use the graphic designer guide. What is that called? The artist, graphic artist guild. Guide. Thank you. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> yeah. I, that I kind of use if it's something really foreign to me that comes in that I just need a base for. But um, I just go off of what I had been charging other people and keep in mind the um, size of the company and I keep in mind how much time is this going to take me and I think that ends up being more with personal projects that um, pe people come in and they'll say oh how much will it cost for this and I say okay well how much time is this going to take me and I think about that a little bit more when I'm doing work for individuals versus for design firms but um, to make sure that it's worth your time but um, you should make a decision of how much it, your, your time is worth, how much your hourly fee is worth, and if it is um, a work for hire or, you know, if there's any other um, caveats on that, that um, you need to be filling up for those um, in addition to what your time would be. Right. Good I, link. <laughs> I was trying, yeah, the link doesn't, it doesn't go long enough, but it's for oh. the Graphic Artist Guild on Amazon, so who knows. Mm -hmm. um, all right, so take us through your process because I think, and I know it wasn't on our questions, but, and I know we have eight minutes left, so just really quick. So you do the yeah. sketch phase or the concept phase and then sketch phase. Can you kind of take us through that so we know? Uh huh. Um, yeah, I'm trying to think of an example of a project that'd be good. Um, yeah, I've, it's very different depending on what sort of project. It is um, again for those 
Paris Baguette illustrations. Those they had a general concept already come up with. Um, but I, um, I think I threw in a couple of poster designs that oh, I yeah. had worked on. And these were um, volunteer projects for um, a friend of mine for this great event in Atlanta. And I wanted to be working on some more type layout anyway, so it was something that was um, that I had wanted to be working on. And so for this sort of thing, it is a more similar process to, say, my um, uh, the whimsy section of my website or the jailbirds, where I'm taking all of these elements and I'm mashing them up together. And what I would actually do is I decided what elements are going to be in this poster, and I would sketch them, and I would like, color them in with a color pencil or marker really fast to get an idea of what the value or color is going to be. And I just like literally cut them out like paper dolls and laid them out and like moved them all around. And there's some posters, these Georgia Organic, Georgia Organic posters are on my website under the food and beverage. Mm -hmm. I did the exact same thing for that. So that can be done, you know, just physically. And it's easier for me to do that than move it around on a computer. It's just when you actually have a tangible object. Um, but then you can also do it on the computer. So, for instance, the jumpers, I have like you know, 50 pictures of chickens, and I'm looking at the silhouette of all the chickens. I'm looking at the feather and the value pattern, and I'm deciding, like, well, what here do I want to use, or do I want to use the feet from one chicken and the body from another, and, like, what is, what's the best solution here? So then I, you know, mash that up on... on um, on Photoshop instead of doing that by hand, but it's, um, I think I know what my solution is when I look at the reference, and then it makes me laugh, and then I'm like, oh, if I'm laughing at the reference, it's going to be, like, ten times better once I actually draw it, <laughs> so, and then, or if it's, you know, something that's doesn't have the funny element, like the poster designs, it's just the, um, coming up with the, uh, the pattern that looks right, and so, so, and this is where teaching comes in here, which helps remind me as a teacher, I um, go through a design um, a really brief design week in my class and we talk about how when you're a kid you um, draw these symbolic landscape pictures. So everyone when they're a kid they draw these landscapes over and over and they got the house and they've got the sunshine and they've got the trees and, and so you draw them over and over and what you're doing is you're changing the size of those objects, you're changing the value of them, you're changing the color of them, you're changing their placement on the page and what you're doing is you're actually teaching yourself how to design an image and how to get it to look to intuitively look right to you. And so when I'm putting together my illustrations or if I'm putting together these um, poster designs that have a lot of different elements to them, um, that's, what I, that's what I'm doing. I'm still, I just, I need to be, you need to be able to play and experiment and um, figure out what's going to look right in and you'll know when it does. And uh, that's the importance of just trying to come up with a lot of different solutions and work through a lot of different solutions. So I'm going to ask what's your favorite media? Oh, that's a good question. I, um... I I love graphite, and I learned how to do watercolor when I was in grad school. I never re I'd painted in watercolor before, but it was I always thought it was this really like wimpy media, and I had no idea that you could get it as like punchy and like bold and bright, and that you, all the value you could get into it. And so I discovered that, and then I just really loved doing that. And um, yeah, the image you have up of the unicycle and tricycle. That one's good because then it's very drawing intensive and watercolor intensive. Um, I think watercolor always feels like a little bit of a fun break for me because you never really know how it's going to turn out. And then I like the graphite because I do know how it's going to turn out. <laughs> so, um, uh, yeah, it's tough. I, I don't know if I'd say one is my favorite. Probably probably drawing is my, my first love. So. <laughs> well, these are fantastic. To me, the detail on these is incredible. But I love the humor. Once again, I think that you focus, and the colors are so bright, and you work so good in black and white, but then your colors are also, and to me this would take forever, and you may think watercolors, what you did, think watercolor is wimpy. I think watercolor, I cannot get it. I want to work too fast, I think. I don't know. I just sucked at it. I made a bad grade in college. It just takes that. work. That's all. <laughs> So yeah. let me let me go through some of these. Do you want to talk about this project? Um, sure. Yeah. Um, I, you just want me to talk about it? Yeah, I'm gonna flip yeah. through. I'm like trying to get. I sell mouse these to work. greeting cards on Etsy, and um, uh, and I sell them at some places in Atlanta as well. A couple of little boutique shops. And this was something that I started like completely just for fun. Like I have like a little like folder in my um 
that I like will put internet memes and just like stuff that's really random into and it's just like fun stuff and like that's where I was originally saving these because I was just playing <laughs> and like I just come up with these little like wordplay ideas and it's just stuff like that just jumps out to me like if I hear a funny wordplay like I'll want to write it down and I just had all these little notes for ideas that was the first one the tomato one and um, and then I just wrote down and I was just like oh that would be pretty cool, cool illustration but you know, and it's 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 easy. I only had to paint two tomatoes. <laughs> it's, it's fast, <laughs> and that's the thing with. I mean, like I've gotten more efficient with doing the graphite, but with this, it's just, I you know, it's, you can get that idea out a lot faster. And I just wanted to get those ideas out. It was more of a creative exercise mm -hmm. than thinking of like coming up with a tangible project. But now you know, it's like I'm gonna little money every month from the store that sells my cars and that's kind of a nice surprise so it's so I kind of yeah so um, but what I realized um, I was talking to an illustrator um, Zelda Devon she's great um, she lives in Brooklyn and I met her very randomly when I was in New York um, a couple months ago and she was saying well what is it that you're just excited about doing like what is it that you're really excited about doing and I was like I like doing my cards because they're fun like there's no stress to have to like bring them up to this like super high level of rendering maybe that I have in the um, in the graphite portraits and it was just so much based on an idea um, and this like kind of visual wordplay mashup thing that um, that I was just like, this is what's fun for me to work on. So this is what I, this is what I want to be doing more of. So I was like, okay, well, great. How can I kind of meld this with the uh, like graphite skills I have? And so, and then the jailbirds were born. So that's. <laughs> I think um, I think those are great. You know, I found that Siri has sort of a weird humor when I talk to her. <laughs> I'm like, you know, you could do something on those because she hears something different than what I'm saying. And I understand that the it's words I said yeah. were similar. Like, I tried to, it was something like, I can't even remember what the word was this morning, but I was like, that sort of, those words sound like the word. It's like word the uh, I said. auto, like, damn you autocorrect. The, uh, that you yeah. can find, like, these bizarre things that are correct. Yeah. I yeah. think that's, uh, it just kind of, I don't know, it, it clicks something in my brain that, is really amusing. So if I can like push that a little further. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I love that. So, well, Catherine, we're about out of time. Yeah. So I'm going to share um, a couple of links with everybody so that they can keep in contact with you. And mm -hmm. I'm going to try to make my window a little smaller so I can um, do that. So there is, I'm supposed to point this way. Is that right, Jason? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> That's the right way. So if you're looking over here at the very top one, the green background, I think, is says uh, that's her website. And then you can also connect with her at Facebook. And I'm going to give you her pages or her page just in the regular chat. So it'll be up there. And then on Twitter, she's at, um, I'm just going to type it in. And I think pretty much you're the same. Thing yeah, on Instagram Twitter and Twitter, Instagram, Twitter right? it's just Catamore Art, so, um... I got it. Yeah. I think that's right. Yep. Um, and then I'll post the thing just in case if somebody wants to click on it. Um, and then, Catherine, thanks so much. I'm going to just share ways to connect with me so people can always email me. I really want to know what you guys think about the new platform. And I realized that maybe the time changed, you get an email 10 yeah. minutes ago or something from me. So I've got to work on that. It was set at the correct time, but something's wrong with my browser, my uh, mail thing. So I'll be contacting them again. So, um, and if you want to connect with me on uh, Twitter or Instagram, I guess, uh, Twitter, the best way to do it is either Diane Gibbs AU or at Design Recharge, and then on Instagram it's at Design Recharge. Um, oh, she, Meredith says, "Have you done? Have you seen the funnies about the Oxford comma? You oh. do one uh, note cards, something like that." Reminder. So that was that is yeah, a I love great. Those. <laughs> and so, let me know what you guys think about this. If you were not part of this and you just got a link from a friend, you can always sign up at designrecharge.org slash subscribeland.html. So 
soon the new website will be coming out and I will have something that doesn't have .html so hopefully soon but Catherine thank you so much I really appreciate you coming and I'm very thankful that I know you know you and I just love your work keep banking funny stuff and I think you should do more more cards I think um, or sell your pieces on Etsy or something because I think they're great it would be great gifts you know Yep, and um, I realized I have a new card that I'll put up on my website soon, so good motivation, people. I'll, I'll put it up today, so you can go and look later in the day, and I'll have it up. <laughs> Fantastic. So, yeah, great. Well, thank you, everybody, and we'll see you. You'll get a new link in an email next week if you're on the list, and that's how you'll get these and Design Recharge. We have two next week, just so you know. Next Wednesday is Scott Beersack. Um, really talented, young, inspiring um, illustrator, designer, typographer, letterer, and he's going to be at 3.30 Central Time, 4.30 Eastern, and I don't know what time it is in Arizona because they're always off because of daylight savings, <laughs> um, and I think uh, California it's 1.30, and then I have another one with the type fight guys on Friday at the regular time, I think 2.30. So. Lots of stuff next week. I hope you guys join us and you'll get an email. Thanks so much, Catherine. I really appreciate it. Thanks so much for having me on the show, Diane. Thanks, okay. everyone, for watching. Bye. Bye.